Hello, everybody. Uh, today, you are going to be introduced to some really important concepts, not just for k-nearest neighbor, but for any machine learning. And they're especially relevant uh, when you talk about neural networks. So definitely, please watch the whole video. Um, let's start with a five-sentence recap of what is k-nearest neighbor, how does it work, um, so it's a machine learning algorithm that we're using for digit recognition. This is a classification task. Classification meaning categorization. So we give it a feature vector, which is a list of numbers representing the thing that we're trying to categorize. And then the output is one of several category labels. So we give it uh, an input that's about 780 numbers representing pixel values. And the output is going to be either the digit 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on to 9. How does it work? How does it decide what category to assign? Uh, the idea is that we have saved a whole lot of examples of input vectors and the right categories that they represent, so the right digits that they actually are. And for an unknown input, what we'll do is we'll loop over all of the saved examples and ask which one is most similar to the one that we're looking at right now. And whatever category the most similar saved example is will be the category we'll predict for our unknown one. How do we decide what similarity means? Uh, for our uh, implementation, we're using uh, Euclidean distance. Okay, so here's the warm-up we did in class yesterday. Um, you should decide not whether k nearest neighbor would be successful for any of these uh, machine learning tasks, because that's kind of an empirical question. Um, instead, could it even be applied to these tasks? Um, because at least one of them, uh, you can't really apply it uh, unless you significantly reinterpret the task. So uh, last block, their thinking was a little bit vague, so let me try and direct your thinking to be a little bit more specific. Don't just think, k okay, nearest neighbor, uh, does it seem like it, yes or no? Be very specific. Give a specific example of what could a feature vector look like? What actual numbers would be the input and what do they represent? And then what would the actual categories be for the output? So go ahead, pause the video. Uh, I think it would be great to talk about this with your people. Um, and I'll give you what last block said in just a second. Okay, so last block, uh, face recognition or identification. Usually in machine learning, recognition would be, is the target thing present or not? So is there a face or not in this image? Identification would be saying whose face specifically it is. So yeah, k-nearest neighbor could definitely be used for this task and indeed successfully for this task. Uh, a feature vector would be similar to the feature vector we're using. So you could just feed it uh, a list of numbers representing uh, brightness values for pixels, for example, in a black and white photo. Um, and then the output, if it was recognition, it would just be two categories, either yes, there is a face present, or no, there's not. Or it could be uh, a number, like a, a relatively short list of specific names for people. Let's jump down to three, email spam detection. Um, this one also could definitely work. The output categories seem pretty straightforward. Either yes, this is spam, or no, this is not spam. Um, the input, initially, uh, the last third block was saying, we'll just give it the whole email. Um, but notice the whole email is not actually a numeric vector. You need to reduce whatever it is you're trying to categorize into a list of numbers. Um, so one thing you could definitely do is have a mapping from uh, characters to integers. So A could be 1 and B could be 2 and so on. Um, a different thing you could do would be to pre-process the email in some way to actually extract features that are more likely to be meaningful indicators of whether or not an email spam. So for example, you could have a list of suspicious words like prince and bank account and credit card. And you could count how many of these words or maybe what proportion of all of the words in the email are on this flagged list of suspicious words. Um, you could look at statistics that might be related to the, the style of the email. So you could look at what proportion of words are all capitals, or you could look at what's the average word length or what's the average sentence length. And each of those numbers could be one of the features in the feature vector. So email spam detection is definitely one where you could apply k nearest neighbor. The middle one is one where you could not. If I'm trying to identify the location of a license plate in an image, uh, third block, 
correctly said, the output would be uh, like a coordinate pair. We're saying the license plate's upper left-hand corner is located at, you know, 100 comma 324. The problem is uh, a coordinate pair as an output is not a category. Um, and like, yes, if you want to quibble, you could say there's a finite number of possible values for the coordinate pair. So it's just a very large number of categories. Um, but I, I think that sort of misses the point. Um, so, so that's why you couldn't really apply k-nearest neighbor to this example. Um, however, you could modify the task to be able to apply k-nearest neighbor. So if you don't care about the exact location in the image, you could break the image down into a relatively small number of regions. So imagine breaking it up into a, like a 3x3 three three subgrid. So now you could just say, is there a license plate present in the upper left, the center top, the right top, the middle left, and so on. And so that's only nine categories. Um, you could also have a tenth category, which is not present anywhere. And so now, uh, now K-nearest neighbor could apply because it would still be a categorization task uh, with a relatively small number of output categories. All right, so on to today's big topic. Uh, the two big questions you guys had coming out of last time was, why does our algorithm work so well when k equals 1? Um, most people who were successful in implementing this found that you were getting 96, 97, 98% accuracy on the test data. Um, and so some people were so surprised that they said, I don't think I did it right. It shouldn't be this good. So why is it so good? Um, and then more generally, what's the effect of changing k? Um, we know that as we change k, we're changing the number of the closest things that we are going to take a vote between to predict our category label. Um, but I think people more wanted to know, how does changing k affect the accuracy of the results? Is it always better to make k larger? You know, how do you decide? So three important new concepts to answer those questions. The idea of a decision boundary, the idea of overfitting, and the idea of underfitting. And like I said before, these are going to come back again and again as you study more machine learning. So uh, at this point, you should have a handout. Um, and we're going to do the handout in a couple of sections. So uh, at the top, I want you to decide. All right, so let's imagine uh, we have a whole bunch of data points that are two categories, either star or circle. So these represent the two output categories. Um, and the xy coordinates represent the input feature vectors. So if k equals 1, and you imagine uh, having your model predict the category label for an input vector that's at the tip of each of these arrows, what would it categorize? So let's just do one together to make sure you have the idea. Um, where my mouse is right now, this one, what would a k equals 1 model predict? And hopefully you said circle because the closest thing to this point in space is a circle. So uh, we would predict that this would also be category circle. Okay, so go ahead, fill in uh, the rest of these for k equals one and fill them in for k equals three. Oh, I didn't change it here. Uh, for k equals three, just as a way of thinking about what will the algorithm do. So pause the video and then we'll talk about what makes sense here. Okay, so for k equals 1, we should have this is a circle because it's closest to this one. This is star because it's closest here. Also star closest here. This is circle because it's closest there. Whereas if k equals 3, the three closest things to this point are circle, circle, star. So this will be circle. Three closest things to this point are circle, circle, star. So when k equals 1, this would be a star. But when k equals 3, this would be categorized as a circle. Uh, here, it would also be a circle. Here, it would be a star. So a lot of these have changed from k equals 1 to k equals 3. And you can think about, uh, is that change more likely to be accurate? Predict are those changes more likely to be accurate predictions or not? Third block felt like, yes, definitely more likely to be accurate. Um, I think the true answer is it's hard to tell with so little data. Um, this one feels like it's an outlier. It feels like it's uh, a lone circle in a whole region of stars. And so if we choose another point in that region, it's more likely to be a star than it is a circle. Um, and I, I agree with that. Based on the data that's here, it does seem like this should probably be categorized as star. But let's pretend that we got a whole lot more training data, and it turns out that there's a whole cluster of circles right here. 
In that case, we would be pretty confident